Thank you. Good afternoon. So we'll start the video, what the talk is about. So, uh, If you meet someone online, how do you know they're who they say they are? When you buy coffee that's labeled fair trade, what makes you so certain of its origin? To be sure, really sure, about any of those questions, you'd need a system where records could be stored, facts could be verified by anyone, and security is guaranteed. That way, no one could cheat the system by editing records, because everyone using the system would be watching. Systems like this are on the horizon, and the software that powers them is called a blockchain. Blockchains store information across a network of personal computers, making them not just decentralized, but distributed. This means no central company or person owns the system, yet everyone can use it and help run it. This is important because it means it's difficult for any one person to take down the network or corrupt it. The people who run the system use their computer to hold bundles of records submitted by others, known as blocks, in a chronological chain. The blockchain uses a form of math called cryptography to ensure that records can't be counterfeited or changed by anyone else. You've probably heard of the blockchain's first killer app, a form of digital cash called Bitcoin that you can send to anyone, even a complete stranger. Bitcoin is different from credit cards, PayPal, or other ways to send money because there isn't a bank or financial middleman involved. Instead, people from all over the world help move the digital money by validating others' Bitcoin transactions with their personal computers, earning a small fee in the process. Bitcoin uses the blockchain by tracking records of ownership over this digital cash, so only one person can be the owner at a time, and the cash can't be spent twice, like counterfeit money in the physical world can. But Bitcoin is just the beginning for blockchains. In the future, blockchains that manage and verify online data could enable us to launch companies that are entirely run by algorithms, making self-driving cars safer, help us protect our online identities, and even track the billions of devices on the Internet of Things. These innovations will change our lives forever, and it's all just beginning. To learn more about the urgent future of the blockchain, please. Yeah, so this is actually a part of a larger course, uh, which we have taught at some corporates. So this is for the presentation, the first module we'll be covering, which is, uh, you know, largely inspired from uh, Bitcoin blockchain, right? And if you look at the motivations for uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, way back in 2008, uh, the globe, uh, we were just recovering from a banking crisis, spark uh, from a subprime crisis, where loans were given out and they were, you know, uh, called uh, collateralized debt uh, obligations, packaged as, you know, derivatives, and passed to financial institutions around the world. And uh, because some of the banks uh, turned insolvent, the entire global uh, banking system collapsed, right? And after the aftermath of this incident, on a mailing group called Cypher Funds, a person by name uh, Satoshi Nakamoto released a white paper and uh, you know a program, version point one of that program, saying anybody who is interested in this philosophy, where you know uh, a P2P payment system which, which solves the double spending problem can install this program and become a miner or validator of that network, right? So people in this mailing group, right, uh, typically cryptographers, economists, who were trying to solve this decentralized currency problem from way back in 80s and 90s, found an inspiration and an economic environment uh, to kickstart and adopt this new technology, wherein without having to rely on banks, they could, uh, you know, uh, create their own currency and have a process where this distributed system of nodes and network can verify and process these transactions on the network, right? So if you look at uh, the objectives of how blockchain as a technology started, it started to address the gap in the financial system. So if you go back to 2008, when there was a huge recession starting because of the, the currency crisis, so that was the time when people were more open to experiment and adopt alternative systems of solving this problem, right? So that is the backdrop for, if you look at blockchain as a technology, right? So it starts with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an application of a blockchain, but blockchain can 
be used in many other areas where you know they, it need not be only for currency or, or cryptocurrency, right? So Bitcoin is popular. So in any introduction uh, of blockchain without Bitcoin is incomplete. So our first module would cover mostly on how the Bitcoin blockchain uh, you know works, so that you get an understanding of how the transaction is maintained and how a distributed ledger works, how the miners validate the transactions, right? So. Moving on. So if you go back to history, you know, uh, when we started, we didn't require even uh, rocks and you know seashells were being used as currency. And if you even go back further, we started with the barter system, right? And then scarce resources like gold or seashells used to be used as an alternative currency because they were scarce. There was a work or a proof of work and a cost required to extract that gold, right? And because it was scarce, people had assigned a value to it and, would, and it had a means to verify that this is pure gold. So people settled on gold as a currency and as a forum way and means of maintaining a ledger. So after that, then we came with the paper currency, right? And then online banking and uh, credit cards, debit cards. And now we see Bitcoins as a decentralized means. So which addresses some of the gap in the earlier systems. So like we said, Bitcoin is a type of cryptocurrency which is digital cash and also it can use, be used, uh, the blockchain can be used to move either currency or digital assets amongst individuals in a P2P manner on the public blockchain. Right? So to define a blockchain, so basically how many are computer science students here? Right? So most of you would have done data structure, right, in the first first year. Right? Uh, so blockchain is a data structure where each block is linked to the next block. So very analogous to a linked list, right? A linked list, you have a previous pointer. So here the pointer is nothing but the hash of the previous block. Right? So the blocks are linked to each other in a timestamp chronological order. It is a distributed ledger, so every node on this blockchain network maintains a copy of all the transactions in that ledger. Okay. So, so all information on the ledger is verifiable and auditable. Right? Um, yeah, so that goes without saying because it's cryptographically secure and very uh, ash. There is a proof of work which is involved to generate these blocks. It is auditable and it is transparent. It's a public network, right? So just imagine your bank's, uh, you know, your passbook, and somebody else's passbook has been linked. You made a transaction from, you know, uh, Ananda sent a transaction to Chetan, so that record is publicly visible on the blockchain network. So Anand's wallet address, you can see there's a transaction it was made to Chetan on the public. So there's no good. Uh, currently, in the banking system, you have to rely on the bank as a trusted intermediary to maintain those records, right? So in the blockchain, this is public and it is untampered. That's what we meant by saying in middle. So each block is identified by its cryptographic signature. We'll come to it later on. This is a cryptographic hash function. So current system, I mean, to go why uh, we need the blockchain, we'll have to look at what, what are the problems with the current system, right? So the current system, so how it happens is there is a intermediary who maintains the book, right? You give the transactions to that intermediary, and the intermediary basically, you know, if there is multiple branch, if you are doing a remittance, the country A branch confirms to the other country receiving country that this transaction has been received. Once they reconcile their book of accounts, that amount is actually transferred, and you are able to go withdraw from the receiving country, right? And in the process, uh, they would uh, charge you fees, they would uh, the intermediary costs of operating these branches and uh, this infrastructure costs a lot, right? Uh, and then there is also uh, micro transactions. If you want to do a one dollar, two dollar, you know, transaction, the cost, the transaction fee is much more than that. So it is not possible to do micro transactions, right? So only transactions above a limit you will be able to do, whereas 
in this system you can also do microtransactions. And obviously then uh, there is a, because financial exchanges are slow, if you send uh, something on Friday evening, you might have to wait till Monday morning for the reconciliation to happen and for you to really, now receive it in your account. Right? So system is opaque. You just try, uh, trust the bank will not go and manipulate that passbook. Or in case of Punjab National Bank, right? You might have seen, right? So there's no single system admin, or you cannot say the staff did it. Staff had the access to the system, right? So system is opaque, uh, lacks transparency and fairness. So the credibility of the entire uh, banking system would come under question. So if everybody goes to the ATM and withdraws their money, the entire banking system will collapse. Right? It has happened in the past in case of UTI, you know, bank fraud, right? So people used, they lost all their deposit. And with the recent FRDI bill, only one deposit up to one lakh thing will be reimbursed, right? And there is also a priority list who will get reimbursed first. So these are some of the problems in the current financial system. And uh, yeah, so uh, the central authority can lead to overuse and misuse of power, right? There is no way for you to go and audit that uh, you know the bill you have, which is promised by the RBI governor. There is no two copies of it. It's physically impossible for you to go and verify that note is not double printed, right? So you just trust the system works. So here with blockchain, it is don't trust but verify. So how do we verify it? What can be the possible situation? Solution, sorry. Is as we as we will see further ahead in the discussion. So the cost of transaction is almost nil or minimal. So whatever it costs to run a distributed system, and with the incentive scheme for the miners, that is the cost for operating the system, right? So based on how difficult we want to make it to uh, you know break the network, the costs go high. But we can always tweak it and make it lesser for a private use case. So this is for public blockchain. So for a private blockchain, cost can be almost zero or minimum. Speed of transactions is faster. As much as a message to be passed from one node to another. Records of transfer of the, of the transactions is transparent and visible for all for better security. There is no involvement of third parties. And for, for the first time in the world, I mean if you realize the significance of it, there is no king or state power required for you to issue and run currency. And if you look how society be, has been organized, once we move, move, from, move from the villages to cities, we always had to rely on a king and his authority to create that coin or that note saying this is you know, uh, certified or authorized by the king. And the society used to form around that structure. But for the first time, people have come up with a solution which doesn't require that sort of a structure. Right? So this which will again lead to greater decentralization. So as we move, as the complexity increase from a village, uh, you know, pastoral economy to an urbanized economy where the complexity was large, so the king or whoever, you know, who used came in to solve that problem of co coordination, right? But when the misuse of that power came about, so this is a solution which takes us back to a decentralized solution without the abuse. So this is a way in which a new forms of groups, organizations, societies can be restructured and you know, issue their own currency. So currency issuance need not be a function of the government. It can be separate and the government uh, role would be just governance not concerned about money issuance, right? So distributed systems, I'm sure uh, computer science students would know the distributed systems. So how is block, uh, it's, and with blockchain, it's not just distributed systems. Distributed systems is one part. The cryptography is one part. And then there is also economic theory, which is the incentive scheme, right? If you look at game theory, it's an incentive scheme where a hacker Instead of trying to disrupt the network, there is a cost involved in terms of computation power, right? So
so it might he might as well be incentivized to become part of the network and earn the fees for validating the network then trying to disrupt the network right so it draws from economic game theory it draws from cryptography and distributed systems so we we'll just look at what is distributed systems i'm sure you have already seen the video this is how the structure of a network would look right so you can go from varying levels of centralization and distributedness so in between there is decentralized network where there are nodes and then there are clients so if you have downloaded any bitcoin wallet app or ethereum you no know, wallet app you would know that there are nodes right so bitcoin network has 10000 plus nodes ethereum network has 20000 plus nodes so any person who is using this network either to do p2p payments or to do smart contracts can become and uh, you know rely on these distributed nodes who are all running the same software and maintaining the ledger right to become and take part in the network so uh, your ethereum would be you know much more general purpose use case it's like a, it's a pure it's uh, supposed to be a turing complete uh, programmability right bitcoin blockchain doesn't have that programmability ethereum blockchain has much more programmability like for example you can say conditional payments right so if you ordered from flipkart flipkart can have a smart contract which says when you sign on the proof of delivery release the payment right so this programmability can be built so uh, the courier guy need not ask your sign right so automatically once the you can eliminate and automate many such processes by using smart contracts so as of now this talk uh, talk mostly about the bitcoin blockchain but if we have more time we can so cover on the ethereum blockchain so distributed system i'm sure i'll just skip over these slides if anybody has a doubt we can, can just come back to this um so nodes in a distributed system every uh, computer taking part and running the protocol of that network is called a node it takes part in a distributed system so the end users whoever is using it sees it as one protocol or one logical layer right it can be a bitcoin blockchain it can be an ethereum blockchain so we see now how the network is structured let's see how a transaction happens when let us say alice wants to transfer something to bob right so let's check how it works so when you start initiating okay let's say james is trying to transfer money to kevin and there is no central authority we always imagine you know some bank or some western union or paypal has to be there for us to transfer this so you have to have all these questions how to verify the transaction you know how is the transaction faster who validates it how is the currency generated right what makes the system cost efficient so these questions we will address one by one in the upcoming slides so first the transaction so what you have is we rely on cryptographic principles you have you might know something called public key and private key right how many of heard of rsa encryption public key private key right so quite a few of you so i think i we have to keep it very basic because i see some from other branches also here right so uh, a public key and a private key right so let's say uh, i want to send a message what is that message that message is a payment message i will i want to transfer 100 dollar 500 dollars to kevin right so as james i'll use my signature to sign or it's called encryption to encrypt it and the resulting hash this is the transaction right is sent to the network right and it is relayed to kevin and kevin uh, you know gets a notification right that he has received right and kevin uses his private key. so you these keys are in pairs public key and private key so uh, kevin would use his private key to decrypt it and he is able to encash and that is a 500 dollar worth it comes so this is how broadly it works so next we'll go in de detail so what is this public key and private key right so where are these keys stored keys are stored in james wallet so 
for accessing this network, you have something called a client application, which is a wallet, right? So just like you have a physical wallet, you have a wallet which handles this private key management, right? It can be a soft wallet like a application, or it can be a hardware wallet, or it can just be a paper wallet where you write down your pri private key on a paper wallet, or you just memorize this if your memory is good. You are able to memorize hexadecimal or uh, digits, right? You can just store it in your memory and that is the most secure one, unless you forget it. So, or a paper wallet or a physical USB key, you can use these as a hardware wallet. So, these are some of the popular ways. How you will uh, secure the private key used to unlock the balance in your account and use it either to receive or send. Right? So, we'll just briefly cover public uh, cryptography. So, it is like an asymmetric uh, uh, mathematical function, a cryptographic hash function, right? So, uh, the public key, whatever is encrypted with the public key, you can decrypt it with your private key and vice versa. Any text can be you know, uh, subjected to asymmetric encryption. And using the private key and public key, you can get the encrypted value and then decrypt the encrypted value. So in case of Bitcoin, this is how a wallet will look like. Right? So this is your Bitcoin address. Just like you have an email address, you will have a Bitcoin address. And uh, the Bitcoin address is alphanumeric address. It represents a destination or a source for your payments. And the wallet is basically the Bitcoin equivalent of a bank account. Right? So this will be like an app on your phone which will manage your private keys. And this is your handle like an email address or a Twitter handle. But it is an alphanumeric address. Right? So which will you can send and receive these transactions using this. So sending is basically, you know, you designate how many uh, bitcoins you need to send and then use the digital signature to sign it so that it is made uh, genuine, that transaction, and you broadcast it to the network. So why is it faster? What makes it efficient? Right? So it's like in a distributed system, uh, you say broadcast it to a neighboring nodes and those neighboring nodes then broadcast it to the, it's received to the receiving party. Right? So it can happen in few seconds and then you get a confirmation in about 10 minutes, typical. Right? can be faster than that when there is no network uh, load. So who validates? So this is the sending and receiving. So who validates and how are they are compensated? Right? So, so there is no uh, central authority. So there is uh, some special nodes in the network who does this uh, validation. They invest in hardware. So when it started, even a person using a laptop could be a miner on the network. And later from CPU to GPU and from GPU to ASIC FPGA miners, right? Which can cost up to 2 lakhs right, for Bitcoin blockchain. But for Ethereum, you can still use your GPU and you can start mining. So miners or validators, so they take part in verifying these transactions and get a reward for contributing the computation or electricity for, to that run that network. So the, this is what secures the network. So there is somebody doing the verification validation, but there is no central authority. There are 10,000 nodes or miners who are doing it. And this is what is securing the network. So how to verify it is basically uh, like we covered in the cryptography part. Uh, the, pub, the private and the public key are used to verify the transactions. Once it is verified, it is stored in the distributed ledger. So there is no single ledger. Every node in the every miner in the ledger will be maintaining a copy, and each block is linked to the next block. So you cannot any change any blocks without changing the hash of that block, right? So the ordering of the transactions, every set of transactions is grouped together in a block, right? And placed together in a block. So the next block, the hash of that block is added you know, in, into the next block. So you have a linked block.
blocks. So it's a, that's why the name blockchain. Right? So minor groups the transaction in a block. There are many minors. So whichever which block to consider, whichever the, based on the proof of work, uh, there is a mining algorithm difficulty rating. So whoever finds the puzzle for that difficulty algorithm gets a reward, and that reward is what is the bitcoin. There is a cost, and then there is a reward. So because there is a cost, it doesn't make sense for a hacker to break into that network. So there is a cost, electricity and computation work which is required. So that is why it is inefficient for any hacker to disrupt this network. So this is the proof of work. The miner is validated and it is validated and added onto the ledger and maintained. So if more than one block, it could, be, it could happen that two people arrive at the same solution at the same time. But typically it is broadcasted and whichever is the longest chain that is considered as the master ledger, as the source of truth and the other miners add blocks to that longest chain and because there are 10,000 nodes adding, these chains are progressing at a very fast rate. Right? So even if there is any parallel change which is being generated that are ignored and the faster chain progresses. So that is how the several branch problem is bypassed. Right? So, yeah, so the longest chain and transaction in shorter chains are ignored and the longest chain emerges as the master copy, master record. So like I said, if miner tries to cheat the system, it's not possible because the hash value of that block would change and every block would change. So it is not possible to, you know, tamper the system of records. And that is why we say, like, so it's like a race. You can imagine there is a block, blocks being added and there is a race, so you cannot just tamper it. Because there are 10,000 plus nodes adding records to the next block and each block is linked to the previous block. So the computation and the electricity just goes waste if you try to create a parallel block. To sum up, asymmetric in the cryptography peer-to-peer -peer propagation stored in a public ledger, authenticated by miners or violated nodes, and secured by a consensus algorithm, which is, we will just add records, which is to the longest chain. Right? So the benefits like we covered already is, some of these are some of the benefits, and access to single uh, source of truth. If you have any questions, you can always, you know, reach out to me or to